Amen. Today's one of those mornings that I want to keep singing, y'all. But that's not my job. <laughs> so I'm going to spare y'all this morning. But um, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 as we continue reading throughout this book. Hallelujah. Last week we talked about giving God the glory where we are and letting the life that God gave us be used for his glory. I pray that you all meditated on that this week and made a conscious effort to bring God glory in the way that you interacted with your environments. But today we're going to be talking about two main ideas, one being the knowledge of God, a.k.a. theology, and also we're going to be talking about the love of God and what it looks like with one another. So let's start. Um, would you all stand with me as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 8? Hallelujah. The reason why we stand is because we are saying, God, this is not Autry talking. This is um, not just some book, but we believe this is your inspired word, and we do bow to it. So let's read. It says, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagined that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many quote-unquote lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no better off if we do not eat, no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged? if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble." Amen. So again, there are three parts really we want to look at today as we move through the text. The first part, we want to talk about the knowledge of God. The second thing we want to look at is the love of God. And the last thing is we want to just kind of tie it all together and see how this affects the way we live our lives. So let's start here at verse 1. It says... Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. All of us possesses knowledge. So what I want to do first is look at, here in this text, it shows us a beautiful, concise picture of the knowledge of God. It starts here at verse 6. It says, there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist. This is the basis level of our belief in God, that everything we see is made by God, and that everything in our existence, it is for God. Do you see that in the text? It says, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. So we already are kind of laying the foundation here that, guess what? This life is not even about us. 
We talked about this last week. If we exist for God, then our life is not our own. I heard Paul say it like this, it's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. We are dead to ourselves and we are alive to Christ. Why? Because it is for him that we exist. That is knowledge, isn't it? It goes on and talks about Jesus. It says, and we have one Lord, one Lord that we serve. Our life is spent not on ourselves, but serving our Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. What is the knowledge here? If you are a believer today, it is through Jesus that you bear the name brother and sister in Christ. It is through what Jesus did in dying and living the perfect life and offering himself as a sacrifice to pay for our sins by taking our punishment and letting us go free. And now the Bible says we are the righteousness of God. And so we are the righteousness of God. We are the holy ones of God because of what Jesus did. This is knowledge. This knowledge ought to be beautiful. This knowledge and this seeking, this type of knowledge of God ought to be worship. The scripture says, study to show yourself approved, not unto man, but unto who? But unto God. So this knowledge that we have ought to be an act of worship to God, right? It ought to be an act of worship when we learn scripture, when we can say, um, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Like, that's beautiful. It ought to be a worship to know theology. But what we see here in our text today is that for those that the scripture is writing to, it says, verse 1, this knowledge instead Puffed up. What does puffed up mean? It means that this knowledge that people were acquiring, instead of being an act of worship, it caused them to be prideful. What does that tell us about acquiring the knowledge of God? It means that knowing about God does not exactly equal knowing God, does it? Talking about knowledge. Instead of being content and enthralled in a love towards God and his people, our knowledge of him can possibly turn to sin. This pride that goes into knowing God, this trap that we can have from growing in our knowledge of God was part of the initial um, deception in the garden. What did the serpent say to Eve? It says, I will, the, the Lord is hiding true knowledge from you. And so she fell thinking that she was going to acquire um, more knowledge. This is pride. So again, this text is warning us against being puffed up. We also see that this pride of um, knowledge described in Ezekiel 28. Let's look at it this This piece of scripture is a unique piece of scripture because in this scripture, it talks about Satan. If you read the earlier verses, and it talks about how beautiful and how wonderful that God created Lucifer to be. And then it it talks about how he was lifted up in pride. If you want to read it, just go to Ezekiel 28. But then it, it then compares Satan's fall to this king. And this is where we find ourselves. It says, your heart was so proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Said another way in context of what we're talking about today, our heart can be, become proud because of our knowledge. 
Our heart can, instead of being an act of worship in our gaining of knowledge of God, that knowledge can instead cause us to be proud. And so that's not what we want here. Talking about knowledge. Let's go back to our text. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagined that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. So again, this is just reiterating the fact that if we begin to kind of feel ourselves in our knowledge of God, if we begin to be um, proud and arrogant, have our nose up in air because we know all of these words that end in ology, soteriology, eschatology, right? Theology. Mike know a bunch of them. Mike is Mike worships with it though. This part of his calling. He is he he he, he loves theology. But the Bible says if you begin to think that you know something, then you actually know nothing. Why? Because that knowledge is worthless if it draws us up in pride. Because guess who else has a bunch of knowledge of God? So now this idea of knowledge is juxtaposed or compared Here in verse 3, it says, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. I would rather be known by God. But it begins to talk about this love. It says, love builds up. And again, remember, this is all in the context of what we're going to get into, but the idea is that this knowledge that these people had wasn't extending to the way that they were treating their brothers. This knowledge that they had became a stumbling block or an opportunity for sin for both them and for the people around them. But the scripture is telling us instead of letting this knowledge do this, we need to instead have a love that builds. This love that builds, this refers to the love that we have with our siblings in Christ. The Bible tells us what is the greatest commandment, that we love the Lord God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and what else? That we love our neighbor as ourselves. So we're talking about a love that builds. This is part of our mission statement as a church. Not only do we want to grow in our love towards God, but we want to grow in our love towards one another. 1 John 4 and 20 says it like this. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot Love God whom he has not seen. Let's just pause there, but can you leave it up? So again, look, think about the context of our scripture today. They are causing their brothers that they are around to sin. Those that they see, and they are doing it in the name of one that they have not seen. But the scripture says that we cannot, we cannot say that we love God if we don't love our brother. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We must have a love that builds. Verse 13 of our scripture today describes this love as a sacrificial love. It describes it as a love that is concerned not only with ourselves, but concerned about others. So here's the scenario that we have here in our text. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. They are in Greece, which is a polytheistic culture. What that means is they're in a culture that believes in many gods. Um, My son likes to read Percy Jackson. Some of those gods are probably the ones that they were serving then in um, Greece. 
And so what the scenario is, is that there were new believers who had come out of this polytheistic culture, and they were now Christians. And the, and the, the deal with this food offered to idols was, it was a situation where they would, um, the, the way that they did their food back then is um, they would offer food to idols, they would burn it, some food they would do this with and that with. If I were to compare it to our modern day, it would be as if they went to a grocery store and, you know, you had your kosher foods, you had your organic foods, right? And then it's, it's as if there would be a section that would be foods that were offered to idols. I'm just trying to make this um, plain for us. And so for some new believers, eating fruit, food from this section, for them it was sinful or it was wounding to their conscience, what that means is that when they were eating it, they then felt like they were somehow joining in with the worship of idols. Let's look at Romans 14 and 20, and it help us explain this idea of our conscience being wounded by something, even if it shouldn't, like it is in the context of this text. Let's look at Romans 14 and 20. It says, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Do we have verse 20 there? Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. Meaning if they ate that food from offered to idols, they would have been fine. But it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. In other words, even though um, these people that had puffed up knowledge were right, they should have taken a back seat and instead worried about what their brother might feel about the situation. Do not, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. So in other words, what this is saying here, if you are cool with eating this food that is offered to idols, then it is, it is between you and God. You're okay. But, whenever, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So what is this saying? This is saying that even though they should be okay, if it is something that their own conscience is troubling them on and they are struggling with this, then they ought not to be eating it. We also see this doctrine in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's turn there. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let one seek his own good, but the good let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? That's the question. But if I partake with thanksgiving, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
but give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. So what is, this, what is that text telling us? It's telling us, yes, it's fine. You should be able to eat and drink to the glory of God, but if it is between you um, enjoying this meat or enjoying this drink and your brother being offended and possibly being caused to sin, then the Bible is telling us, don't eat it. We're going to get into some application for this. I know this is a little bit strange because we don't deal with food offered to idols, but hopefully we'll be able to tie this together. But I just want us to understand the concept first. So instead of operating out of the knowledge that builds, some were operating out of a knowledge that puffs and they became a stumbling block. For them, they were willing to not defer themselves and being okay with instead offending their brothers. Matthew 18 and 1 tells us about the seriousness of this topic. It says all... At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put in the midst of him and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives such a child in my name receives me. Now here's the key part. This is why this topic is so serious. It says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned to the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptation to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one through whom the temptation comes. Are you seeing how this relates to our topic today? This is saying it is better for you to not offend one of God's little children, one that may be younger in the faith, one that may know less about God than you. It is better for you to worry about them than to offend them because if you do offend them and cause them to sin, Jesus is saying it is better that a stone be tied around your neck and you be thrown into the ocean. That makes this text serious, doesn't it? But again, if we go back to the beginning of our text, it says that um, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. What does that mean? It means that we should be concerned about our brothers and sisters in Christ. It means that this life that we live in Christ is not a solo venture. It is not just about me and God, but if if my relationship with God has an effect on someone else, I need to pay attention to it. This text is calling for us to be aware of our siblings in Christ, that they are not wounded by our choices and our Christian liberties. Now, no one's going around eating food from the idol's market, right? Right? So how can we make this relevant for us today? Here's a few examples of things that, we, that may be good and that may be okay, but they may have the potential to wound our brother or sister's conscience. The first one that probably pops into some of you all's head is alcohol. The Bible tells, we, we read it today, we can eat and we can drink to the glory of God. What does that mean? We can drink and be giving God glory in the midst of drinking. But that same scripture also warns us if we are around someone who has a weak conscience and is not okay with that and struggles with it, guess what we can't do? We ought not to be taking them out for drinks. Okay, what's another example? For some of us, we, again, something that isn't good or bad is neutral would be something like our politics. But if my politics will cause my um, brother or sister in Christ to stumble, then guess what I'm not going to be doing? I'm not going to be talking to them about politics. Okay, what's another one? Another one may be entertainment choices. I know this one firsthand. I have, me and my, my brother loves to watch uh, Netflix and watch movies. Um, and he made fun of me because 
We, we want to watch, like some things that he can watch, I can't watch. Does that mean that he's in sin because he's watching it? No, but what that means is if I tell him that I can't watch this, there's too much um, debauchery in it, um, it, it might be too much um, sexual overtures, or it might be too much, he likes to watch these Viking shows, it might be too much like sacrifice and stuff, then that means that he's not going to watch it with me. Why? Because he is concerned about my conscience. Just trying to make it plain for us. Maybe it's exposure to certain things that we may not be ready for. Um, for, you know, like I may be talking to someone and I may, but, may be able to read certain things that are um, bad theology. But if my, if my brother is weaker in the faith and doesn't know as much, maybe I shouldn't talk to him about that because I don't want to get him confused. Another one is about as plain as it can get. Maybe it is just certain conversations and certain comments that even if they are true, the hearer may not be ready to hear them. Or better yet, maybe it is a certain comment or a certain conversation that may be true, but it is not said in love. Again, the scripture is calling for us to be aware of how we live our lives in the midst of one another to make sure that we are not the source of temptation or sin in our brother or sister in Christ. Put simply, let's be sacrificial in deference of loving our brother's over our personal freedom, even in good things. We do this out of the knowledge described in our text, and and we do this out of a love that builds, and we do this out of a love that God has given us. Let's end with verse 3. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Let this be the knowledge that is our greatest knowledge, that we love God and in turn that we are known by God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for this simple word, Lord, that is causing us to teach us to love one another better. Lord, these are your children who you died for. Lord, don't let us be a stumbling block for another. Lord, if that has been us, if this word has found us, Father, we repent in the name of Jesus. Lord, we repent if we have let what we believe to be truths to affect our brothers and sisters in Christ in a negative way. Lord, help us, Father, to put others before ourselves as we glorify you. Lord, let us be known in our knowledge as having a knowledge that gives you worship. Let our growing in knowledge cause us to worship and to love you and love others more. Lord, we pray, God, that you would give us a heart that is a love that builds one another up, God. And lastly, we just thank you, Lord, that we are known by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.